to begin with this inspirational music called Day of Inspiration. Listen as it goes forth. We are here with the I Will Restore podcast. Day of Inspiration. Feel yourself moving to a new level. Anticipate it happening in your life. of the foundation being laid for a new life, new ideas, new concepts, new thoughts, held on to, causing examination by you what the thing assessment of things that you have assumed to be true. Have you been telling yourself the truth about yourself? You better than what you thought you were. There's a way that you can critically assess and others have said so that you might arrive at a full complete understanding gradually of your full potential who you are what you're capable of being doing and having this is a day of inspiration Welcome to the I Will Restore podcast. I'm Dr. Dennis L. Waters Sr. We have been talking about three individuals, really, and a host of theories, as we call them. And we mentioned the fact that the reason why we call these theories is because even though they have been tested in the lives of other people, it is vital that they be tested in your individual life. And that's one of the things that is involved in that which we call the Lamas, L-A-M-A-D, transliterated from the Hebrew, the Lama educational process, which we teach at Spirit Victory Praise Transformation Leadership Institute University. We teach that so that an individual understands that truth really comes about as a result of an individual testing. The text says, prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. And so an individual testing to see if something is true in his or her own life. Because there are a lot of things that are involved that you can be told are truth. But it becomes truth in your individual life when you test it to see if it is true in your individual life. It is If it is both truth and true in your individual life. Why is that so? Because there are so many subjective factors that are involved in an objective statement. So many subjective factors. In other words, each person is building his or her own objective reality. Every individual is building his or her own objective reality. And that is a result of our individually being created by a creator to become a creator. 
All of us have been made in the image and likeness of the Creator. All of us have the ability to create, to bring something forth that is unique, that is one of a kind, based on our individual uh, gifts and talents and our individual experiences in life. And we, every one of us, have the ability thereby to be unique and to be one of a kind and to do something that has never been done before, no matter how many times it has been done by somebody else. We are able to do it at another level, to another degree, in another way that has never been seen before based on our individual individual, undivided oneness, undivided oneness. And it's vital that an individual, each one of us as individuals, undivided ones, arrive at the point in concert with the divine, that we arrive at the point that we understand how to live and have our being in that which is God, in that which is spirit, or as that which is God, as that which is spirit. And that's what I will restore is about. I will restore the years that have been eaten and wasted. And that's what this program is about. And I've discovered, I've discovered through living that there are tools and techniques that can be used for this purpose. There are tools and techniques that can be used for this purpose. So we've talked about and because of the way things are today, we have the various programs that we've already done, and those can be provided to you. Those can be provided to you. They are up for a period of time, and then they go back, and we can provide those to you so that you can get them and use them, and use them according to your schedule. And as a result of that, they are just simply able to be provided to you and these things, these particular programs, make it possible for you to listen to the parts of it that are of great importance to you. So those become uh, able to be listened to you so that you can apply them according to your particular desire, according to your particular need. So that, again, things are done in such a way that it is unique to you. So we've talked, just in review, we've talked about the... Four initial steps, which we call the four D's, that it was desire, define, divinely intended, and then lived on the fourth dimensional level. I mean, that in and of itself, that in and of itself, when practiced, has great benefit. It is worth hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to identify those things in your own individual life, those particular items in your own individual life. You can find those, those four Ds, whether you call them four Ds or five Ds, and I'll get to that in a few moments. Uh, those, those things, just helping an individual to be clear on what they, as an individual, not what your mother wanted, not what your father wanted, what you desire, what's, what's important for you as far as life is concerned. And then get to that process where you actually identify what you desire. What is your desire? It's not what your mother wanted you to do, not what your father, not even what your community wanted you to do, but what you feel inspired to do from within. And what you feel inspired to do from within, based on your talents, your gifts, uh, your abilities, what, what is within you, what you feel is right within you. Uh, and it could be in line with what mama wanted, what daddy wanted, all of those uh, things, what your family has done over the course of years. All of that could be uh, really uh, someone who loves you, pointing you in the right direction. And then we talked about this aspect of the next four steps, which had to do with the aspect of uh, taking 100% responsibility for your life, having no one to blame, no one, blaming no one, choosing to blame no one, and then forgiving everybody 
and then joining or forming a beloved community. Uh, the beloved community becomes important because when a person, especially no matter if a person is doing something in regard to moving forward into the future, uh, if a person is recovering from a traumatic event or a loss or whatever it may be, there's a need for a beloved community. And we'll talk about that in just a moment and come back to that. Uh, in regard to what is involved with that. There, you need someone uh, to have a conversation with, what seems to be an objective conversation, a conversation outside of oneself, which is really one of the reasons that I, too, even in the doing of these programs, uh, I'm doing them. Because I've had this conversation that I'm having with you. I've had it on paper. I've had it in my mind. I've talked with a number of people in regard to the things that we're having a conversation about. All of these things I've done over the course of time, over the course of years, I've, I've had this conversation. Join a form of a love community. This is part of that process to move this beyond my own self. Uh, in the sense of an individual, physical individual. And so that whole piece in regard to that. I shared with you something on the back of one of my uh, books, on the back of one of my books, the book Steps to Christ. And I have did that, I've done that in regard to a couple of editions of this book because the original book, and when I say my book, the book that I have is called the Steps to Christ Study Workbook. It is available the, through the Apple Books uh, uh, program, and then it's also on Amazon. Uh, it is done by, um, presently it is done by Teach Services, uh, I believe, that has that particular book. Uh, you can find it there. And then also via the Apple program, I've placed it there. And then I have PDFs of the books as well. And so there are, and, and we do a class in regard to that, which is involved in what we call join a form of beloved community because we wanted to have a Facebook group that we, that was worldwide really, uh, so that we can have a conversation and, and I'll talk about that conversation. But, but one of the things I wanted to do today was to read to you the original, the original back cover of this item because it is so vital that you understand this join and form a beloved community, join our form a beloved community. Uh, I actually, when I initially wrote this book, it was done within a spiritual center or church setting. And as I mentioned previously, excuse me, <clears throat> as I mentioned previously, uh, this was in a setting in which a few people were accustomed to speaking. And many people were accustomed to listening. And what the dynamics of it was that the few who were accustomed to speaking felt that they were the ones that knew. They knew. And therefore, they felt that they spoke for all. And those who were accustomed to being quiet, they felt that they had something to say, but the dominant individuals within the city, they felt that they just ruled, and therefore they stood up, and they spoke up, and therefore they were in charge of whatever was going on. But when I did this, and other things, the, everybody was required to actually do the work. That meant that we had a set of questions that, <clears throat> excuse me, let me take a sip of water. A set of questions, uh, each chapter of the book, Steps of Christ, there are 13 chapters of that book, and each chapter was dissected in such a way that I came up with a set of questions in the book. The book can be read without my particular book, and that book, the Steps of Christ uh, book, uh, originally done uh, in the early uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, I believe. Uh, that book has been distributed uh, over 25 to 50 million and perhaps even 100 million copies of that book have been scattered all around the world. It was done by a lady named Ellen G. White. Um, uh, it was originally done as an ecumenical book uh, so that it could uh, tell the story of what it meant to grow up as a Christian grow up as a Christian, no matter really what your particular um, denominational persuasion may have been. It was growing up as a Christian. What does that mean? How is that done? Uh, 
that whole entire process in regard to uh, taking steps to the Christ or being Christ-like. And there are other books that are in that same vein and helps an individual go through that process. I talked of one of those earlier in a previous uh, presentation called Training the Twelve. It's the same kind of uh, genre. It's the same kind of book. And so the Steps of Christ book is uh, like that. And when I read it, it impressed my heart about what it meant to grow as an individual to grow and and get the illustration in the biblical statement there are a number of those that talk about this growth process uh in the book of romans it speaks of being transformed by the renewing of the mind so there is a mind element that is involved and later paul says we have the mind of christ uh, let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus so he is talking about this growth process that is involved as we read and study and meditate and have communion with the Christ. And it's talking about a spirit, really, uh, that has a mind, a thinking process that is involved with a person being a Christian. And so this book, the book's the Steps of Christ Study Workbook, which is like an aid to the book Steps of Christ. And so you have the book Steps of Christ, right there, and then you have the study workbook. And then even by oneself, if nobody else is with you, no physical person is with you, you still have what we call the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God that is there instructing you. And you're writing it down so you have it in an objective form. That's vital. But then when you have others there, there's something that is special that takes place. And the biblical statement says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, now, now please understand, and you may consider it whatever way you want. The, the, the um, psychiatrist, Carl Jung, spoke of what he called the uh, collective uh, unconscious, or you might call it the collective subconscious, whichever way you want to do that. But he, in my estimation, again, was speaking of the same thing. When we speak of the spirit, he called the collective unconscious. In other words, there's something unique and special when a group of people get together and they seek to come on one accord or to think together and to think alike and to solve challenges that they all have and to come together and to say that we're going to come up with a solution for our situation. There's something unique and special that happens when a group of individuals working together, work together. And so this is what this book is about. And I'll talk about that in regard to uh, transformative learning theory, because the individual Mesro, Mesro, who developed that theory, has a place in his theory that says the very same thing. And a group can be a dyad, as I said earlier. It can also be a triad, which is group, dyad is two, and then a triad is three, and then it grows larger. So if you got a leadership body within an organization, again, that leadership body can be two, it can be three, it can be 10, it can be 12, it can be whatever. But it's vital that they are on one accord, that they are working together and not working separate from each other. It's vital that that takes place. Let me read to you what's on the back. I read it. This is similar, but it is more, it it has more words than what I said previously. It says, from the center, in the center, in the center of the life, live from the center. The oak is in the acorn, the tree is in the seed, the better country, better community, the better spiritual family, church, synagogue, mosque, and people is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Many people want change and transform and transform, want to change and transform things and people outside of themselves without first being transformed. This methodology brings no lasting growth, no lasting betterment. A wiser way is change from the center, change from the inside, the epicenter that spreads outward, upward, and forward. An acorn is the beginning of massive change in landscape. The seed is the beginning of great change in beauty and bounty. You are the beginning of tremendous change in community, family, church, synagogue, mosque, and people. 
The book Steps to Christ is about changing the land by changing a man, a woman, a boy, a girl. This Steps to Christ study workbook guides you in digesting and distributing the food for change found inside this classic volume, the Steps to Christ book. By stimulating new thoughts and opening up for investigation old ideas, you are planting the acorn of truth in the midst of the peopled landscape of this world. The seed idea of acknowledging one's need of help. The seed idea of repentance. The seed idea of trust. The seed idea of life first and growth to follow. Planted in the center of your being ensures massive, great, tremendous change, growth, and development. So, my friend, a better world is within you, and in your hands is the key, the passport, the seed, the acorn, the beginning you need to get us all there. From the center, in the center, in the center of the life, live from the center. Now, when I did this originally, which is before the years 1986, say to 1997, that's the time that I was putting all of this together until finally it came into the form that it was a book because the individual chapters, of course, were written as individual chapters. And we were doing it as I was writing it along with a set of Bible studies that we were writing at the same time as well, as well as doing pastoral work, of course, and a few other things that I was writing as I was doing this. And so we did this and then we were study. And as I said, the amazing thing were that the weak were becoming strong and they were becoming strong in their voices. They were also being healed and delivered and set free because the word of God, whatever and wherever you may find that word of God, makes it possible for the weak to become strong. The text again says, I sent my word and healed them. And it was taking place right before our very eyes. Because the word, the Rima word, as we call it, is intended to be heard and to be received. And when people prepare the ground, just like you prepare the ground, uh, when it happens in regard to life, when the farmer prepares the ground, it receives the seed. It is ready to receive the seed. And when that seed comes, they know it. And that seed being planted in the ground brings forth the fruit. And that's what was taking place in regard to this and the people landscape, because the seed is planted in good ground and an individual is prepared and ready and willing and desirous to bring forth the desires of their own heart, others will see it and then they will desire it. It can happen inside of a family. It can happen inside of a family. I've seen individuals in my own family. As a result, I'm my mother's first child that graduated from high school. But I'm not my mother's last child or my mother and father's last child that graduated from high school. I'm their first child that graduated from college, but I'm not the last of their descendants that graduated from college or will graduate from college. I'm not the last. I'm not the first. And my own siblings I've seen graduate from college as well. And then my parents' grandchildren have grown on to college, and then their grand-grandchildren have grown on and graduated from college. My mother played piano, and now she's got a descendant that plays five instruments. My older sister could draw and play piano. Now we've got a, a photographer, I believe, who has just won awards and become a McNair scholar. It is so amazing, and I say to each one of them, Mama would be glad, Daddy would be glad would be thrilled about who they are and who they are becoming and what they are doing. And I see this all around. I see the talent, the skills, the abilities coming forth. Why? Because there was a new dream birthed. And how did that dream become birthed inside of me? Because really, I learned to read. I learned to write because my mama held my hand and taught me how to write. I learned to read because my mama provided a Bible, and I say a book that had the story of Ben Hur, and I it was a picture book that was there, and my mama loved to read as well. 
And I watched her and learned to read. I really learned to read from reading comic books. You, get, It was a frame by frame detail of something before there was Marvel on television and on movies and all of that. There was Marvel comic books. And it was frame by frame by frame, like Shakespeare, Stan Lee invented words, invented words. And so all of this was taking place. And that's how I learned to read. Now, other things were important, but those things were seminal in what was taking place in my life. Seminal. And of course, when you read a comic book, you go and you have a conversation with others in regard to what you have read. And so this beloved community becomes vital. It becomes vital. And inside of a spiritual spiritual, what we call a church or a spiritual center that's dedicated to the study of these things that we're talking about and called them spiritual, these become even more important, even more important. Why did I choose these individuals? I've gone to school, as I've said, and I've studied those things that have to do with theology and those things that have to do with divinity. I've got the degrees of that because having gone through what I did as far as life, and there was both good, what I considered to be good, and there was that which I considered to be not so good. And I had to count it all good and say that all things work together for my ultimate good. And that took growth on my part. That took direction on my part. That took a whole lot of help on my part to be able to actually come to that point. And it took a while. It took a while because I was hurt and I was angry. I was going through a whole lot of feelings that I didn't even know how to name at the time. And I mean school even to this day in regard to all of that. And there's a whole lot of articles that I've read in order to understand me and what has happened in my life. And I've arrived at this point where I see these theories that are helpful in my understanding of my process of growth. And so I can put them all together. Rather than throwing away that which is beneficial to me, my parents would say, eat the meat, throw the bones away. I found those that help me and have helped others. I still pick out individuals and I've, I've seen little geniuses come forth in regard to life because I've found some things. I take young children now. I uh, teach young children how to count. And I, I, when I was growing up, there were individuals that would say that you had only so much intelligence and that you got that from your parents and you could not grow in regard to your intelligence. Well, uh, science has proved that to be wrong. Your brain can grow. And it, can, it starts to grow from before you're even born. And that if you exercise it, it'll keep on growing no matter how old you get. I have an uncle who's 103 years old and he is still sharp. He is still sharp to this very day. Still sharp. He has been a fixture in my life, all of my life. He was there when my mother passed away. And he is there in my life even now. And we still have a conversation. He's still correcting me to this day. And so your mind can keep on growing. Still keep on growing. And how do you do that? Well, as a young person, I had a young person that was maybe, let's say, two years old. And one day I was asking that young person, two years old now, two years old, young black boy, young black young man. And I was asking him, could he count he said, yes. And he counted by one and he counted, I think, up to 50. And then I said, can you count by two? Two years old. And he started counting by two. And I think I helped him count by two. And we counted by two to 50. The next thing, it was a young lady who was in a uh, daycare. And we did the same with her. She counted by two, and she did it so fast. She learned so fast how to count by two. We gave her a system how to do it. We asked her to count by three, gave her the system to do it. And she learned how to count by three. She's two years old. By the time she was four, she was counting by six. I believe it was six. When she graduated from daycare at five, she was tested. 
She was doing math on a fifth grade level. Doing English on a third grade level. She was counting by 12 at five years old. Multiplication, really, at 12 years old. We had her and another young man and still another young lady doing the same thing. That's community. That's growth. Let's listen to some more additional motivational songs here. This is the other one. Think what could happen for young people in your life. come in here at this point I had started reading something for a moment and put my head down and before I knew it we were back on the air again my apologies to you for that and what I was looking down at again I'm talking about this aspect of this young lady and she was at the point where she was counting on the fifth grade level, she was doing her studies on the fifth grade level, and her study of math was on the fifth grade level. Her study of English or English was on the third grade level, and she was five years old. And we've had a number of young people that we work with in regard to that. Now, please understand that when I say this, there are a number of ways that we look at and seek to understand how 
It is that we know that a person is, first of all, capable of understanding what it is that they are ready for and willing to learn. And one of the ways is we talk about things on their level, on their level, on their listening level, and on their learning level. And to understand, and one of the things that we do is that we talk about the entire thing of what we call the hero's journey. It is a, the hero's journey is a structured way to talk about things on any particular scale and level and learning style. It, it can just be adapted to anything. And so I had a, a situation where there were uh, two young, uh, they were twins. They, they were twin, a boy to girl. And the young man had a different learning style than the young lady. And so we were teaching the young lady, and the young man had a different learning style than she did. And what we needed to do was to be able to reach him. And to reach him, we started asking him various questions. And then one day, we happened upon talking with him about a cartoon series that was called, and it actually had been made into a movie, that was called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And for the first time, this young man told me, so that I learned for the first time, that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that their mass and their colors had specific meanings that identified what each one of them was capable of doing. And so he actually schooled me as to what each one, what that each one had particular talents. I had never thought about it before. I had never understood it before. But the concept goes in line with what we call the hero's journey. It goes in line with what we're saying right now. And it, again, speaks of the principle that I was just mentioning in regard to the community and each one person, no matter what the size, no matter who that person is, they have particular gifts. And he was demonstrating that he had particular gifts. He had, he did not learn the same way that his sister learned. If we were to look at it in a particular way, his sister may have been able to learn in a linear way or left brain way, but he had an understanding of patterns and he was able to identify what those patterns were, how they went together, how the colors went together and what they meant and what was being said. And he therefore talked to me about Raphael and Michelangelo and Donatello and all of these things. He put all of these things together and told me exactly how they went. And I actually have a video of him pointing out to me how that went. And it was amazing. And I then listened to him. And when I listened to him, this is a five-year-old young man, and he got his mother's permission in order to speak with him and to have him record it because his mother and his father were excited that I actually understood what he was saying. Now, with all of these children, all of these children I'm speaking about, we initially said to them, to their parents, that they needed to get a tutor. Now, imagine this. These are young African-American children, and we're saying to them, that at five years old, they need to get a tutor. And their parents were not initially of the mind they needed to get a tutor. Why did I think they needed to get a tutor? Because these are bright, intelligent young children you're trying to fit them within a classroom that's not ready for them to be able to actually count at, at uh, do math at fifth grade levels. They're in the first grade. And to do English at third grade, they're in the first grade. And they will want, the school will want to actually put them in the first grade and to actually have them do work on the first grade. Well, they will get bored to be there in a first grade class. I actually had an experience previously where I was in a class of young people. And uh, this is another story, similar story, same kind of environment. But I think this was seven to eighth grade. I was in a class doing work in that class as a substitute teacher and the teacher is standing up front and they are doing what they call like a morning ritual or whatever it may be teacher standing up front and they are doing a correction of a paper that they have already done this paper and everything like that where they answer like 10 questions or whatever and there's a young lady sitting there and instead of paying attention to the um, attention to the teacher she's got her paper on the desk and reading a book that had like 750 pages. 
and she's like midway the book and she's not checking her paper. And I initially took her book, I asked her to give me her book and I took her book. And then when I gave it back to her, I looked at her paper. She had every answer right. From that point on, I didn't bother that young lady anymore because I realized that she had already done the work that the teacher was asking the, the rest of the class to do, and she was doing her work days ahead of time, that I was actually slowing down her process, slowing down her growth. And she was in the seventh, eighth grade. These young children were in the first grade, and they would feel the same way. They would feel the same way. And so I said to the parent of these young children, get them a tutor. And initially they did not. And then later, as the children encountered various challenges, the parents understood what I was saying, and they got these children tutors. And I've seen one of them um, a few years ago, excuse me, a few months ago, and they did get them tutors, and they've had tutors over the years, over the years, and they are still doing really, real, really well. And they are actually being socialized well, all of these kinds of things. And I invest in these young people. Don't give them a great amount, but give them great encouragement. And God knows as I get great amounts, I just give them, I just give them, I just encourage them to keep on growing, keep on going. They will change the world. They saw the world differently. This theory, constructive developmental theory and transformative learning theory, all have, the hero's journey theory, all have this idea of the importance of joining and forming a beloved community. All of them have this idea of constructing what we would call a new idea, our new vision of who it is that you can be. All of them have this idea. It is also part of this idea that we mentioned in regard to this particular this particular presentation that we're doing today, where we talk about become new, become new. Who it is that is becoming new, because this newness starts with a new you, a new identity. If you're someone who has been hurt or abused or told who you could not be, then the newness is that you are redefining who you are. You're no longer going to allow who or what has told you who you are to define who you are anymore. Whether that's along racial lines, whether that is along how you have been hurt, what, no matter what the defining may be, if it's outside of the center of you, then that definition does not count anymore. And you're not going to allow the external environment, the, the mass production of images that go on in the world to define who you are. No matter how many times it's flashed in your face by the media of any kind, because there's a mass production that goes on that is happening all over the world that where images are being put before you to define who you are, and they can be overwhelming in regard to seeking to define either one individual or seeking to define a group of individuals. It can go on again. We were told that certain individuals were smart and that certain individuals were to be leaders and certain individuals were to be this, that, and the other. All of that is a made-up story. All of that is a made-up story. We were told that, you know, that when it comes to Africa, it used to be called the dark continent and that the people there were not intelligent. That's all a lie. That's all a lie. The records have been found that in Ethiopia, there are books that are ancient that come from the universities that were at Timbuktu. The records are being found that reveal that even when it comes to sailing the seas, that people of African descent or from the continent of Africa had reached the Americas long before, long before Columbus reached America. 
And so it becomes important that we have a collective understanding. And it's important because the aspect that we get to define who it is that we are. There's this, there, there, one of the reasons that I like a person like Emerson is that Emerson has this amazing chapter in his book that opens up all kinds of possibilities. And the way that he says what he says is that history is really a statement about the possibilities within the human. And he says that anything and anybody who is mentioned in history is just saying to a person who and what they can be and who and what they can do and who and what they can fail. Uh, feel. It's just a powerful, powerful statement. And it's like he begins one of his essays that there's one mind that's common to all people. All people. One mind that's common to all people. And that what anyone has ever felt before, what anyone has ever done before, any person can do. I want you to listen to what I'm going to read and listen to this with an open mind because it comes right out of the book called This Is It by the person named Dr. Dr. Murphy, Dr. Joseph Murphy, who was a chemist. And I read this this morning and it is an amazing statement. I, I really read it and then when I thought about this program for this day, it is in line with what Emerson said, but it's different. But listen to what it says. This is chapter 11. If you'd like to receive a copy, email me at info at IWillRestore.com. And even if you don't like to receive a copy, you may know someone that's maybe they could be locked up in jail. They could be on the street somewhere. We've had people who we found on the street that we shared with them some information and the the pull of the street was just so powerful and so strong. It was difficult and challenging for them to actually stay off the street because, again, this program that's in the mind was so strong. And people that were on the street were actually pulling them back into what they had already been accustomed to. But I, I, I pray, again, that there's some way, somehow, that you or someone that you love, no matter what they're doing, no matter what has happened to them, that you can reach out and help them. Because, again, people who are in prison, they say that there's a recidivism rate that is so high, but it does not have to be. It does not have to be. Anyone that tells you that what has been has to be, they're lying. They're just lying. And even if you're telling yourself that, you're lying to yourself. The truth is that you can begin this very moment change everything. So I read this, and I'm reading it for my own benefit again, and I pray that Someone, you, will get this. It's called Oneness with God. And previously I only had Emerson that said that, but this is so powerful. Chapter 11, this is it. He begins, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me quoting from Isaiah 45, verse 5. You, the reader, are the only, are the one and only being there is. When you say I am, that means a sum total of all the personalities in the world. All other conceptions are projections in the space of the one being, yourself. 
in the Bible, which is a textbook on psychology, metaphysics and man's moods and feelings, the I am is constantly referred to as I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, verse 6. I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. I am that I am, Exodus three fourteen. These and similar sayings shine forth in all their true brilliance when once we see that Jesus, the Christ, was not speaking of himself personally, but of the principle of being inherent in all mankind. When true students fail to see, what true students fail to see is that there is only one person for the same reason that there is only one God. God and man are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, John 14, 11. You cannot divide the one. Infinity cannot be divided or multiplied. The seeming divisions are the illusions of separation. We must give recognition to that innermost self, which is pure spirit and which is not subject to any condition whatsoever. We feel that we are conditioned by time and space, but these conditions have no place in essential being. The true recognition of the I am is the acknowledgement of the self within you. God, the Father, eternally subsisting in his own being, sends forth all forms of his will. Likewise, all forms return to the formless one according to an immutable law. You, the one man, can comprehend the infinite self within you by a limitless expansion of your conception of God. You thus return to the universal being as a son coming home to his father. The more we study the Bible, the more we realize that by the art of meditation, an example, by going inward, we become greater in our knowledge and comprehension of the mysteries contained therein. The road inward is the road to greatness, the royal road of the ancients. And for all men who desire to become united with the supreme cause, the root and substance of all. Rebirth means to ascend inwardly from the lesser to the greater by an inner realization, or by the lifting up of consciousness from one step to another. The consciousness being lifted up by the contemplation dwells on the fact that I am now the being I long to be. And to make it real, I must feel it. This realization is an inner awareness of the new state of consciousness or rebirth. There's not a single note that was ever played. And this was the part that got me because it is in line with what Emerson said. There's not a single note that was ever played that any man cannot play. Anything that has ever been felt by any holy man, any man can feel. There are no facts or secrets hidden in the dim past that any man cannot bring to light. You are the only being there is. You have a memory of all that has passed. Consequently, all tones, moods, vibrations, knowledge, and wisdom are within you. There is no language that ever was spoken that you cannot speak. There is no voice that you cannot reproduce because all is within you. You have always lived. Before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty eight. When all things cease to be, I am. You, man, wrote the Bible. You may have forgotten it, 
but if you meditate on its passages, the subjective self within you will reveal to your conscious mind what you meant when you wrote it thousands of years ago. Time is an illusion. God is the eternal now. Thousands of years are as an instance. Eons are as a day. Therefore, shed now the belief in time and the idea that we have come, we have to come back again and again to this earth plane. One time is John, another visit is Mary, in order to gain more experience, to perfect ourselves and become as Jesus the Christ. We're sometimes told that it is almost impossible for us to become as Jesus or Moses or Elijah in one lifetime. It takes several lifetimes. Moreover, many say that we have some karma to work out in this life. In other words, we must expiate for the sins and crimes committed in past lives before we can be purified. Some state that it is almost impossible to change certain physical conditions in this life particularly if one happened to be born with a congenital disease or deformity. This teaching is false and a contradiction of everything the Bible teaches, namely, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32, verse 27. I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, said the Lord, Jeremiah 30 and verse 17, who healeth all thy diseases, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles, Psalms 103, verses 3 and 5. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death, Hebrew, Hosea 13, verse 14. A cripple is not instantly healed because of his belief or your belief. Likewise, if a man's leg is amputated, the reason he does not grow another leg is because his father and mother, the authorities of certain textbooks, plus the tradition and race beliefs, all contribute to the false belief and teaching he received as a baby. He holds a firm conviction within himself now that God cannot grow another leg for him. He firmly believes that nothing can be done for him except to wear an artificial leg. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Regarding the belief of some people that we must suffer for errors of the past or for sins committed centuries ago, there is no basis for this false concept. If a person believes that he must suffer for something he has done, he will suffer. It is all based on beliefs. The only loss, the only limitation, the only restriction or evil in the world is our belief in loss, our belief in limitation, our belief in restriction, and our belief in evil, our belief in disease. This is known as the son of perdition, our sense of loss spoken of in the Bible. Come now, the text says, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Their sins and inequities will I remember no more, Hebrews 10, 17. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. It says the reader should stop, think, and realize for a moment that a God who says, Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. By necessity of his greater love blots out all of the past. He wipes away all tears and forgives you immediately. Can you imagine a God asking you to forgive those who trespassed against you and in another breath refusing to forgive himself? He shall call upon me and I will answer him, Psalms 91, 15. I, even I, am he that blotted out all transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sin. Man completely detaches himself from the past by partaking of a great psychological and mystical feast of peace and happiness. Realizing the presence of God within him, he rises in consciousness to the joyous conviction that he is now the being he longs to be. 
Having fixed his stake within him, a silent inner knowing possesses him. All former doubts and fears pass away and shall be remembered no more. By sustaining this silver inner feeling, this silent inner feeling, that which he felt inwardly becomes expressed outwardly. The sum total of this idea is to whatever level, to whatever degree, that you are able to convince yourself of the reality of your desires. To that degree, both science and spirituality agree with you. And as you live in harmony with that, especially inwardly on the fourth dimension, then that manifests, that comes forth. You must, I must be in harmony with it. As we close our eyes and sleep, as we rest, as we dream, as we meditate, as we consciously and still within ourselves that we are who we say we are and not who it is said that we are. Regardless of what is going on around us, regardless of what is said about us, we are who we say we are. That's what I will restore encourages individuals to do. We not only encourage verbally, we provide you with tools and techniques by which you can actually do this. It's a training, not just simply a teaching. It's a training process. And we ask people to value what it is that is done. Value. What is it worth to you to achieve your dream? I've seen the pyramids. I, 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 I think I mentioned, maybe not, but the one of the teachers that worked with me saw my value. One of the teachers that worked with me was a Dr. Kane Hope Felder at Howard University School of Divinity. I was a student at Howard University School of Divinity, and I was... As a young child going to school, initially from the 7th or 8th grade, I took a set of tests that were administered by a librarian and a counselor, Ms. Barnett and Ms. Blunt. And they looked at that set of tests and said that I could go to college. I later went to school and I informed others that I could go to college. Now, I had no money that I knew of or anything else, but I had a dream about going to college. I eventually went into the Army because there was what was called the GI Bill. And I went into the Army and studied and eventually uh, came out of the Army and attended school. And when I initially went in, was in school, I dreamed of going to Hampton. My uncle had gone to Hampton. And then I dreamed of going perhaps to Howard because I had studied the history of Howard. When I came out of the Army, I went to school later at a school, and it was not Howard, it was not Hampton. It was years later that I attended as a minister a school, and then as a minister, I eventually read a book by a man who was a professor. I did not know him, 
but I was intrigued by his book. I read it at least eight times. And when I was transferred, I ended up going to the school that this man taught in. His name was Dr. Kane Hopefeld, and he was a teacher at the Howard University School of Divinity. Because I had read his book when I was in his class, and he asked for a writing assignment to be done, I was actually able to do that assignment in such a way that he approved of. I did not know him prior to going to the school, other than the fact that I had read his book. And I read the book eight times. I became a well-liked student in that class by him. When I sat before the class, when I would speak, he spoke approvingly of my speaking. One day I went into the class, and afterwards I had set up an appointment to see him in his office, and when I went to his office to ask him my questions, he allowed me to ask. He very patiently answered all of my questions, and then he said, do you know why you have come here today? And I said, yes, sir. I came here to ask you my questions. And he said, no, you came here because I want you to be my graduate teaching assistant. And that day I became the teaching assistant of the Honorable Dr. Kane Hope Felder. And he taught me how to teach on a college or graduate level. I was more than honored. He changed my life in so many ways, taught me how to teach because I was giving everybody A's. He said, you can't do that. When I was teaching, he was correct me while I was standing up teaching. We went to Egypt together. Egypt and Israel together with a group of, I think it was like 70 people. And there were lessons learned there, things taught there, things seen there that were amazing. I honor him because Dr. Felder changed my life and the lives of so many people. His writings, his teachings, I honor him. And in October of this past year, 2019, October the 1st, Dr. Felder transitioned from this life to the next. Again, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? And so, join and form a beloved community. Become the person that you know in your heart that you really are. This is a day of inspiration. This is a day that changes your life. Listen to more than the voice. Listen to the spirit as it speaks to you. God bless you.